I want you to take out your sermon notes today, and then today we're going to do a little interruption in God Will. God Will Speak, we talked about last week, but we're doing an interruption today from God Will series to, I want to talk to you today about what we're going to talk about is an awakened. Awaken that God wants to awaken the church, awaken us from our sleep, from our slumber, maybe from our laziness, from our casualness. The Bible says that God says he doesn't want us to be lukewarm, but he wants us to be either hot or cold. You see, it's easy to be lukewarm. Lukewarm means that you're just going with the flow. Lukewarm means I'm just going to go with whatever feels comfortable, whatever feels normal around me, but I'm never going to go against the flow. I'm never going to go against the grain. I'm never going to go against the the force of what everybody else is doing. I'm going with the popular vote. But God doesn't want us to be with the popular vote. God wants us to be boiling hot or cold for him. God wants us to be progressing and going forward. You never make any stride, like I said, until you stick out your neck. And God has called this church for this hour, this time, for this season, to awaken the communities that are around us. And how do we awaken the communities that are around us? It's by you. It's by one another joining together, one another, and we realizing that God can do great things through a church that's awakened, that's alive for Christ. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto thee in John 12, 32. And what John, Jesus wants to do, he wants to be awakened up from the grounds, up from the grave, up into life through us so that other people may see, sense, and know the peculiarness of God moving within our midst. And we as a church get the opportunity to experience a miracle in the move of God here at Adventure Church. I was thinking about this sermon today, just thinking about, like I said, it takes an elephant 22 uh, months before they have delivered their little baby elephant. Well, Cheryl and I have been here two years, two months, exactly to the day. And I started reminiscing as I put this sermon together. Matter of fact, I had to do this sermon in part two because as I wrote this sermon, I kid you not, all of a sudden 22 pages came out of me. Okay, I just began to write in 22 pages. My wife began to type. She said, honey, you're not going to get this done. I said, I know I can't shut it off. It just keeps coming out. God keeps pouring into my heart. God keeps giving me new stuff. So I'm going to interrupt the, the Awaken series or the, uh, the God Will series and do the Awaken series for two weeks, and then we'll get back to God Will. But over the last two years, two months, God began to speak to me. What has transpired in our church? For those that are new that many of you may not know, I came here and God was, we were at one service and we met at one service, but then God began to move and God began to do some great things in our midst till eventually we outgrew one service and we went to two services. And from two services that our children's department then the following year grew to a point where they had five kids when I first came here. Now the highest we've had is 76 kids. And so we've been growing like crazy. And then we had a split our children's department and had the older kids go upstairs and the younger kids go downstairs. We had to bring on another children's pastor to be able to accommodate the needs for our younger kids. And so what happened is God began to be doing new things. But then through the process of the 22 months that we've been here, 26 months I should that we've been here, we've had a change of teams. We had change of uh, staff members. We've had different staff members. Now we have new staff members. We have new parts to the puzzle. We have new pieces to, to put together here at at, church, at Adventure Church, and God is doing some great things. And so I began to put all that together. God, why are you doing this in Adventure Church? And God began to speak to me that everything he does is in steps and in processes. And so in your life, what God does in your life, God does things in steps or in processes. When I was playing basketball at college, I lived on the third floor. My wife and I lived on the third floor apartments. And these apartments were old. They were not new apartments where they have elevators to take you up to the third floor. We had to walk the three flights of steps. And man, I'm going to tell you, getting out of basketball practice, especially on the first few days of practice, man, our, our coach would make us do all kinds of wind sprints and man, just kill us to a point that man, all I wanted to do is find the couch and crash, right? Well, I'll never forget when I went, got left practice and I had to walk home, but man, I walked back to my place and then finally get to my apartment. I had to walk up those flights of steps. And each step that I took, man, I felt exhausted. My legs were already burning from doing the squats against the wall and doing the wind sprints and all that we had to do and the jump roping and everything that our coach put us through. But then, man, I had to walk those steps. And I started to think, God, man, I'm tired. I want to get an apartment on the first floor, Lord. And I started to murmur. 
And as I began to walk, God began to speak to me. And as I stepped one step at a time, I got to the second, second floor. And all of a sudden, God said, see, if you continue to put one step in front of the other, soon, as the old song goes, you'll be walking out the door. And so I, man, I stopped at that flight and got my wind together. And I started up the journey to the third floor. And as I got to the third floor, my calves and my thighs and everything were burning. Man, I was just exhausted. And I pulled out the key to my apartment, and I unlocked the door. And the first thing I did is shut the door, and I crashed on the couch. And what God began to show me is that Adventure Church is in the steps of process. We're in a process. We're in steps. Each step that we take is another step to the victory. Each step that we take is another place where God wants us to go. And God has the church in steps. He's taken us through a process, a process of touching lives, touching hearts, touching community. And here's the great thing. We all have a part of that process. We are all a team. There's no big eyes or little U's. You see, if you have your sermon notes, I love this. There is no I in team, but there is I in win. There is I in win. As we work together as a team, you and I, when you and I, what unity stands for, unity stands for you and I tie. When you and I tie together, there is no limit to what we can do for the glory of God. But there is no I in team, but there is I in win. And as we work together as a team, we will win for him. You see, that's what it's all about, that we are a team. Maybe some of you were on the orchestra team. And in, in college or maybe in high school, even up here, I've noticed when they were doing worship, Andrew was doing the lead part, but some of the singers weren't singing all the time through the whole song. You see, what happens is on the orchestra or even on a basketball team or whatever teams, a lot of times you may not be playing something, you may not be making a noise, or even if you're in a choir, you may point to the altos, but not the sopranos. But there's a moment when the sopranos or the altos or the basses will sing. And what God is doing is sometimes times in our life, we all need each other. We are a team that makes the symphony, that we make the noise together for God. There is no eyes. There is no little eyes or no little use in this church right now today. You today are important in the eyes of God. God wants to use you, and God wants to pour through you, and God wants to make you a vessel that he can use for the glory of him. I don't know about you, but I want to be on God's team. Somebody say amen. Don't you want to be on God's team? And then when we when joined together as a team, we win. And then it becomes all about him. And I want to encourage you, join the teams. You should have seen us here today. Some of us were here at 7 o'clock in the morning. Some of us were here at 8.30 this morning. We need teams. We need people to help set up the children's church. We need people to help set out in the foyer. We need people to help set up here. If you would be willing to help join a team, to be part of a team, to be part of the symphony, to make the noise that sounds beautiful when we work all together for the glory of God. I want to encourage you to enlist. But I thought to myself, who am I? Have you ever thought to yourself, who are you? Have you ever thought, who are you? Think about that for a moment. I want you to turn to your neighbor and ask your neighbor, who are you? Come on, turn to your neighbor. Who are you? Have you really ever thought about who you are? You see, a lot of times we say, well, I'm a father. I'm a father. I, hey, I, I'm a father. I'm a mother. Maybe you're a, 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 a computer buff, and maybe, maybe you're a sports or an athlete or whatever. But we all have different things about who maybe we are. Maybe we're identified as, I, I'm the son of so-and-so. I'm the daughter of her. I'm the daughter of so-and-so. And we all got our reason about maybe who we are. But I want to talk to you today about who you are, that God created you to be. And if you have your notes in 2 Timothy, it talks about some great things. And I love this verse of scripture in 2 Timothy about how God or Timothy explains about how we have a purpose in life. Each one of you have a purpose in life. When you have a purpose in life, it gives you enthusiasm, energy, and efficiency. It makes things move smoother in your life. When you have purpose, when you have direction, when you have guidance, when you know who you are, are, when you know what you're doing, when you know where you're going. I don't know about you, but put together a husband and wife for once. And when they find out, hey, where do you want to go eat at? I don't know. Where do you want to go eat at? I don't know. Where do you want to go eat at? Before you know it, the car is saying, just pick a place. <laughs> and you end up, what you end up doing? You end up saying, forget it. Let's just go home. But when you know where you're going, hey, let's go to the Olive Garden. 
You both say, yeah, and the car is happy, 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 because you have a purpose and you know where you're going. And a lot of times what happens in life, many of us are like a dog chasing our tail because we don't know the direction or purpose that we have in our lives. And most of all, we don't really know who we are, what we're created for, and what we're all about. You see, a lot of times we think it's just about eat, drink, and be merry. That's what I'm fear for. That's what I'm all about. Eat, drink, and be merry. That's not what God created you to be. God created created you with a purpose, with a meaning, with a direction, with a vision, with a hope, with a plan in your life. I always say you plan your work and you work your plan. If you don't have a plan in your life or a purpose in your life, how are you going to work your plan? How are you going to know where you're going? So I want to speak to you today about who you are. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20, it says this, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special, special purposes. Now, I want you to underline that if you have your Bible. It's for special purposes and some for common use. So in other words, some of them are for special purposes. I don't know about you, but Thanksgiving is coming up and Christmas is coming up. And those are my, my crybaby seasons. I kid you not, as soon as I walk through Mall America or any kind of mall who's praying, playing Christmas music for the first time, I kid you not, don't stand by me or be by me because I'm going to start crying. I, I just get overwhelmed by Christmas music. I love those holidays. I love when we as a church, if you're in need of a Thanksgiving basket, we as a church give them out. And last year we gave out 65 or 66 in the end. 66 baskets we gave out last year of turkeys and the whole uh, fixings and so on. It just overwhelms my heart. But it made me just think about this. My mother-in-law, every time we'd go to my mother-in-law before she passed, at Christmas time or Thanksgiving time or whatever special occasion it was, was she would always pull out of her china hutch how many of you have a china hutch amen how many of you have your special dishes right and i'm going to tell you my mother-in-law would always pull out her special dishes she had man special dishes they were really nice crystal dishes she had the silverware but they were actually silverware silver silver silverware right does that make sense right she had the silver forks the silver spoon and she would put out all the fixings and once you walked in and you see the table, the way it was decked out, you knew that it was a special occasion. You knew that you were feeling honored or that you were feeling respected or loved by the way she had the spread, how the tablecloth was set, how the table was set with the, the silverware and the plates and the crystal glasses and everything that was there it was all tidy and in place. And you knew that it was special. But in what, look what it says in the next verse. It says, those who are cleansed. That's you and me. Aren't you glad that you're forgiven today? Aren't you glad that Jesus said, I don't remember your sins or your faults anymore? I mean, I blot them out, that you are cleansed, that you are forgiven. The only one that reminds you of your past is the enemy or yourself, because sometimes we're our worst critic. But when God cleanses you, there's a purpose in his cleansing. See, God doesn't just want to come into your life and he lives in you. He wants you to be somebody. He wants you to be special. I don't know about you, but at Christmas time, man, when my grandkids come, I have eight, another one on the way. My, my, my older son getting ready to have a granddaughter. I'm thanking Jesus. Amen. Now the girls are outweighing the guys. It used to be four and four. Now we're going to have five little girls and four little guys. Hey, I, I told my son, you got to make it 10. Come on. We can't have an odd number, right? But it's so funny because when we get under the Christmas tree, how many of you usually buy, usually buy your grandkids or your kids toys that require batteries? Amen? And then when you open those bad boys, man, you think it's only two batteries that go in that remote control car? No, it's eight. So you can't go to the store because the Christmas stores are closed. So you have to go to Quick Trip or you have to go to a gas station and pay triple the amount of money for the battery that you normally would buy at Walmart, right? Come on, you know what I'm talking about, right? But you know what? Those batteries, when you've got them in the package, they don't look so inviting. They may say Ever Ready on them or a Duralite or whatever else kind of brand of batteries that they are. But those batteries in the package are supposed to become out of the package, and they have a purpose for them. You see, it's not just to sit on the shelf and look pretty by the packaging and the gold and black of the battery or the silver or whatever the ever batteries look like. But they have a purpose, and that purpose is the moment they are utilized for their purpose, that toy 
begins the work. Man, I don't know about you, but I made a mistake a couple a couple of Christmases ago. I brought my grandson one of those fire engines, man, with the sirens on it. Made all kinds of noise. It never was quiet all night long. He kept it on on, and every time he moved at night, it was like alarm clock that went off all night long. And how do you tell a kid the first day he gets a new present, turn that thing off? But Papa, okay, keep it on. Okay, no problem. But you know, you, it has a purpose. And every one of us has a purpose. And that purpose is that God is inside of you. So he says this, those who are cleansed themselves from the latter, from your past, your yesterday experience, will be an instrument. Now watch this, an instrument. You have cellos, you have violins, you have trumpets, you have horns, you have drums, you have all these piccolos, you have all these different instruments, and each one plays a different part. So watch what he says. To... For a special, for a special purpose. So what did God do? He cleansed you, made you whole, made you upright, made you righteous, made you perfect in his sight, not to just have you sit on the shelf. He created you fearfully and wonderfully with a purpose. And the reason why I ask you the question, who are you, is because sometimes you don't know who you are. And because you don't know who you are, you can't find your purpose. And so today I want to help you find out who you are for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do good, any good work. So God says that you are made holy with a purpose. So the first thing about you, who you are, number one, if you have your notes, you are a child of God. Aren't you glad that you are a child of God? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 that you've been adopted into the kingdom of God, that he has adopted you as his sons and his daughters, that he has accepted you as his own, that he very well calls you his sons and his daughters. The first purpose in your life is that, God, I'm your son and I'm your daughter. My purpose in life is to do what? To worship you and to honor you. You see, listen, I love what it says. Before you were born, you were on God's team. You are on God's team. God said in Psalms 119 that he created you fearfully and wonderfully and knit you together in my mother's womb. So you were on God's team before you were even born, that God had a purpose and a plan for your life, and that when God made you, not only did he make you fearfully and wonderfully, but he put a purpose. He put a desire or hope in your life, and that's Jesus Christ. He put that in you. He says he made you to be his sons and his daughters. You were made with the DNA of a champion. Come on, you're a champion. And in order to be a champion, you have to get in the race to run the race to become a champion. I don't know about you, but how many remember back in the day, Wheaties commercial? Come on, you remember the Wheaties commercial? Remember the Wheaties boxes? Man, I always envisioned myself, I had a big dream, to be on one of those Wheaties boxes. Come on, come on. Don't be all humble and pious. I know you did the same way. But I always remember Michael Jordan was on there. I remember the Dream Team from the Olympics were on, on there. I remember one of our Olympic uh, gymnastics uh, persons was on it. But every time they would come out with a new box on the Wheaties commercial of a champion. And I would always envision that, man, someday, God, I want to be on that box. I want to be a champion. I want to be, and then not only did I eat Wheaties and thinking I was going to be a champion every time I ate them, but I collected all the boxes. How many of you ever collected the Wheaties boxes? Come on, we got some back over here, amen. And I used to collect those boxes. And man, all they did, I put them in a box and kept them in another box, kept them in another. My mom would finally say, son, what are you going to do with all these boxes? Oh, mom, someday they're going to be worth some money. Come on, you know what I'm talking about, right? But I always envisioned myself being on a box. But obviously that dream didn't come to true. But you know what God spoke to me about? He said, CJ, you are a champion, and you're a champion in my eyes, and that's all that matters. You're a champion in my eyes. You may not be on the Wheaties box. Now, get this. You may not be on the Wheaties box, but you are in the Lamb's book of life, and that's better than a Wheaties box. Come on, somebody give the Lord praise. Amen. You are a child of God that God's wrote you in the Lamb's book of life, and one day soon, you're going to be standing before him, and he's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Go into the place that I prepared for you. What else are you here for? Who am I? Number two, you are a worshiper. 
Man, you're a worshiper. You are created to worship God. God says he inhabits the praises of his people. He inhabits the praises. You know what I always say? When I, my hands go up, the praises come down or the blessings come down. So I love to lift my hands because when I lift my hands, the blessings come down. I praise and I worship God. I lift my voice unto the Lord. He inhabits the praises. You know what? God is a jealous God. I'm a jealous God because I'm, I'm a jealous guy because I'm not going to let no rock cry out in my place. I'm going to cry out. I'm going to praise God. But he says, he says these words in John 4. He says these words in John 4. He says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers, who's the true worshiper? Those that have been cleansed, those who have noble purposes, those who have special purposes in your life. You are that one. You are that one when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You see, when you make a connection with God, that God, I'm going to connect with you and God, I'm going to join with you. My praises are going to go up and your blessings are going to come down. That God, I'm created to worship you and I'm not ashamed of it that's why Paul says in Romans 1 16 I'm not ashamed of the gospel he said I'm going to worship you I don't care what other people think say or do about me I'm going to praise you you are number one in my life I'm going to seek you first the kingdom of God and your righteousness I'm going to praise you God and I'm going to worship you then he goes on to say in verse 24 he said for they are the kind of worshipers the father seeks the one that worships in spirit and in truth that's what God wants you to do. Your purpose is to worship God. He said God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in the spirit and in truth. That God, I'm not going to worship you because my grandma or my grandpa go to church or my mom and dad go to church and I'm being dragged to church. I'm going to worship you because God, that's what I want to do. It's in me to worship you. It's in me, Lord God, to be all what you want me to be. Another thing that you were created for, who am I? Who are you? Number three, you are a conqueror. Man, come on, somebody give the praise to the Lord. You are a conqueror today. How many of you have ever said this before? Man, I'm going down. I'm never going to make it. I'm defeated. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm at my last rope. Things are bad, man. Pastor, this, that, the other. You said those things. Well, here, let me tell you today, you're here today. You conquered whatever storm you were going through at the time, which you said you were never going to make it through. Guess what? You made it because you're here today. You may be going through a storm right now in your life. You feel like you're being overcome instead of being an overcomer. I'm here to give, give you hope. I'm here to give you encouragement. You are a conqueror through Christ Jesus. That's why Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, I am a conqueror. I love what Romans 8.37 says. No, in all these things, in all these things, whatever you face in life, Whatever you face in life, whatever battle, whatever struggle, young people, you're facing situations in school, adults, maybe situations on your job, maybe in your marriage, maybe with kid issues, whatever the, the struggle or the problem may be, give it and present it to God. He said, knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, who loves you. And because he loves you, he's not going to abandon you in the midst of your struggle. He's not going to abandon you in the midst of your battle. How many of you ever had friends? They say to you, Pastor, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I want to support you. I want to stand in your corner. Oh, man, I'm behind you. But as soon as you go through conflict in life, where are those ones that said they're going to be there? The only one that really stands with you a lot of times through thick and thin is the Lord. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He sticks closer to you than a brother. And what God does, he's not only there to help you, but he's there to cheer you on. He's there to cheer you on saying, you can do it. You can make it. You can do it. When I uh, used to run track, I'll never forget when I was running track, and one of the times I was running track, my legs cramped up. And I mean to tell you, I was running the mile, and man, I was running against Jim Shack, and I'll never forget this. And my legs cramped up on the second round around the track. And man, I could barely walk. I could barely walk. I was either number one in state, Jim Shack was number one, or I was number two, number one, number two. Kept going back and forth, back and forth. And I'll never forget, rainy day, Saturday morning, we're at Case High School in Racine, Wisconsin. I'll never forget this. I'm running, and the first lap, it was great. Second lap, my legs just got like rocks. I could barely move. I didn't feel like I had legs. I just felt like I was walking on stilts. I couldn't move my knees, couldn't move my legs. And my, all of a sudden, in the inner side of the track, there was my coach. 
His name was Coach Streeny. And you know what Coach Streeny was doing? Every step of the way that I was trying to run, he was running with me. And you know what he kept saying? CJ, you can do it. Come on, CJ. Come on. And he ran with me every step of the way. Till eventually I made it around the second time, started on my third time around the track, and my legs finally loosened up. Now, I didn't take third, I first, or I didn't even take second, but I took third. But you know what really inspired me was my coach Streeny that was inside the track. You see, he didn't fight the battle for me. He didn't run the race for me. I had to run the race, and I had to go through the struggle. But he was in the track, inside the track, cheering me on. You see, listen, that's what God does for you. What God does, he lets you go through the struggle, but he's in the inside of the track cheering you on. He's letting you know that you can do it. You can do it. Don't give up. You're more than a conqueror. He's your cheerleader. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll give you instructions to help you, but he won't always necessarily jump in the battle. He wants to see if you're going to hold on to your faith. He wants to see if you're going to trust him when you're going through the storms of life. He's in the inside of the track. You can do it. And as you continue to put one foot in front of the other, you will become a conqueror. Without a struggle or battle in your life, you would have nothing to conquer. In conquering, it shows your faith, trust, and belief in Him. In conquering, it has I don't quit attitude. I don't have an I don't quit attitude. I'm not going to quit. Number four, you are made to love your neighbor. You are made to love your neighbor. In this time in our society right now, in our world, there's a lot of hate going on. I don't know about you, but man, I'll tell you, there's a lot of hate going on, and I hate it. I, I, I'll tell you, I don't like to see the anger in some of the people. I don't like to see the division going on around us. I don't know about you, but that just stirs up me. I don't like that because I'm a lover and not a fighter. But you know what Jesus has called the church? Jesus has called the church to set the tone and to be the example. To be the example, to be out front, setting the tone, setting the pace to others to follow. And you know what that pace and that example is? By loving your neighbor as yourself. You see, one of the things that I've learned through the years as being a pastor for 38 years, there, there's going to be times we're going to agree to disagree. There are going to be times that we're not going to love each other. There are going to be times that, man, I may not feel like I want to be around you, but there's one thing that I'm going to do. I'm going to always continue to walk in love even though I may not feel it. And what God has called the church to do is to love your neighbor, to rise up and set the tone. Be the pace setter. Be the Indy car that sets the pace at the Indianapolis 500. Be that pace setter. Be that pace setter of sending, I'm going to love you no matter what you may do. You ever notice what Jesus said? When they strike you on one side of the cheek, turn the other. You ever notice what Jesus said? To forgive 70 times 7. Man, what God's called the church to do is to rise up. And my challenge to this church, to Adventure Church, it's let's love one another. Man, let's love one another. One of the things I told my staff at staff meeting, we're going to fumble. We're going to fumble the ball as we grow into this situation here at school. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fumble. But you know what? Every time they fumble, they don't quit. The team doesn't quit. We don't give up. They don't throw in the towel. They keep pressing on. They keep fighting the battle. And I want to encourage you, we're going to fumble sometimes as pastors. I'm going to let some of you down. I'm going to maybe do something that maybe you don't like. I'm going to say something that maybe you don't like. But I'm going to tell you this, that never once have I ever, ever intentionally tried to ever hurt anybody from this church or my prior churches because I love people and I love you. And I want to encourage you, let's be a church that loves one another. You see, loving your neighbor means putting them sometimes first before yourself. Putting them first before yourself. Loving your neighbor means going the extra mile. Loving your neighbor means making a sacrifice even when it hurts. Another one is this. You were made for harvest. You were made for a harvest. You say, a farmer's greatest time of the season is harvest time. How many of you know what I'm talking about? The greatest time for a farmer is harvest time. Harvest time is the reward of your hard work. I remember my grandfather, when I would go to the summers, go to my grandfather's farm. And my grandfather, man, he was a farmer, 50 dairy cattle and all what he did. He was a simple farmer. And back at those times, we didn't have the big combines and stuff that we have now today. We were simple. 
we had the two bottom plows and then we got advanced to a three bottom plow and man we did all the hard labor but I'll never forget man seeing all that hard work and picking up rocks out of the field and all that we had to do to prepare the soil to produce the crops but then when harvest time came my grandfather transformed he transformed man from a guy that was tense frustrated not sure if the crops were going to produce, if it's going to rain enough or not have enough water, this, that, and the other thing. But soon when the harvest was ready, my grandfather turned into a lightning bug, man. I mean to tell you, he just glowed. You know why? Because it was harvest time. All the hard work that led up to the harvest time, that was the reward of seeing those, man, wagons just being filled with grain, corn, all those things. It was the reward of being a harvester. So who are you? You are a harvester. Every one of us is a harvester. You see, the excitement of the believer is not just our salvation in Christ, but it's the salvation of others. I love this. When someone comes to Christ, angels in heaven rejoice in two ways. Number one, that the lost has been found. Can you imagine that? Every time when someone comes to the Lord, the angels in heaven rejoice. But you know what the second thing that the angels in heaven rejoice about? Is that you led them to Christ. That God looks down and says, that's my son. That's my daughter that's doing the work. They're making themselves available. You see, God doesn't always look for those the equipped he calls those that are available, then he equips those to make the, to become disciples. God equips you. In Matthew 9, as we close, Matthew 9, 37 and 38, who are you? You're a harvester. Then he said to his disciples, which is you and I, we're disciples of Christ the moment we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We have a purpose in our lives for a youthful purpose. One of the greatest things that you can do, the Bible says in Daniel, that those that win souls will shine like the stars forever. One of the greatest things that we can do, folks, is to lead someone to Jesus. And we as a church have a responsibility. He says this, the harvest is plentiful. Oh, there's all kinds of harvest out there. Man, if you notice all the time, you look in the newspaper, the Sentinel and the advertiser, all the things that you read in our communities, you can see about all the drug paraphernalia that's going on and all the things that are happening here in our own communities. That's telling me that the harvest is dying. And the Bible says how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The problem is, are we bringing the good news? The good news is that Jesus can set the captive free. The good news is that Jesus can deliver you from your addiction. But how can they know if they have not heard and God has put an assignment on me as a pastor, as my wife. Man, nine years ago, and I close with this story, nine years ago, you got to get this. I came minding my own business to Cyrus Assembly of God. For those that are new here, I was in the middle of a building program, $7.4 7 million building program. I was in the middle of a building program. I was taking a break from a Sunday. And when I'm off on a Sunday, I never miss church. I never miss church. I'll go to any church. I don't care what kind of church it is. I'm going to church. And I came to this church nine years ago. I'll never forget. Nine years ago, I walked in this church, minding my own business, sat on the right side of the church where Carl and Gail Lake sit all the time now. Well, now they got a new place over here. And I sat over there, minding my own business, in the middle of a building program. Why am I here? I'll tell you why. While I was sitting there, God began to speak. Not knowing anything of what's transpiring today, what happened now. We got in the parking lot and got up to, to the driveway, ready to take a left there on 35. My wife said to me, said, honey, how did you like the service? I said, honey, I wasn't there. She said, what do you mean you weren't there? I said, honey, I don't know what this means, but this is the craziest thing. 
God said that I was going to be the pastor of Siren Assembly. Check this out. That was nine years ago. Guess when I came here? I came here almost exactly to the date seven years ago. It was seven years exactly to the date that God called Cheryl and I here. But why did God call us here? We took a little church down in St. Paul. We called it Eight from Great. All Hispanic people didn't speak an ounce of Spanish. Harlan and Mark Anderson and Quinn came down there. The church was so messy. We took this little church. God kept speaking. The siren, the siren. So eventually, here I am. But what did God call me to do? Why me, God? He said, I want you to go to Siren. I want you to go to Siren and do this. I want you to hear this. This is where you come in. I need you to enlist. He said, I want you to go to Siren. And it is, man, I feel for those mothers who go through labor pains. Because I'm laboring right now with a vision. And he called me and said, Pastor CJ, I'm calling you to Siren and the surrounding communities, Grantsburg, Webster, all in Luck and Frederick and Man Spooner area. I'm calling you to build a church of a thousand people. I said, God, why me? He said, because I equipped you. He said, how am I going to do it? He said, you're going to wake the sleeping giant. We as a church are called to wake the sleeping giant. And here's what he said. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Today, my challenge Every time I see you, I want to encourage you, challenge you, inspire you. So today is my challenge. Jeff, my challenge. Hear you, Pastor. My challenge is that we as a church rise up and take our rightful responsibility as harvesters to a lost and dying generation. That's my challenge. You got to help me birth this baby because believe me, it's a heavy load. And I want you to enlist. I want you to enlist. I challenge you to win one for God. Will you stand with me? It's what I want you to do. Even though right now it's full. But I want you to turn around. It's full in here anyway, but turn it in your seat right where you're at. Can you do that? Just turn in your seat. If you notice, there is a few chairs over here to my left that are open, but majority it's full. But I want you to envision today that chair having somebody that you need to introduce Christ to. Who do you know that needs to know Jesus? You put them on your hit list. You are a mafia for Jesus. That's what we are. Come on. We're a mafia for Jesus. We're going to take these communities for the glory of God. I close with this. I went to the poorhouse. I went to the Dairy Queen. I went to the Pheasant Inn, and I went to the uh, uh, Adventures. And I told all four of those restaurants, eventually, starting next month, we're going to start bringing 400 people to your establishment. And the lady at the Dairy Queen says, I can only fit 78. I said, that's okay. We're going to play the game sardines. We're coming to bless our communities. Somebody say amen. We are a church that's going to touch the harvest. We are a church that's going to rise up and say, I will pastor, enlist in bringing in the sheaves for the glory of God. Let's win one. Let's win one for Jesus. And let's get your name in the Lamb's Book of Life alongside that one that you win for Jesus. 
Come on, church. Let's rise up. Next week, we're going to talk about how we're going to awaken. But today, my challenge, let's win one. Let's win one. Let's win one. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for this wonderful congregation. All our friends and family that are here today. Lord, I pray, God. Lord, this burden sometimes, God, gets too hard. I need people to enlist. I need people, Father, to help carry the load. Let's win one for God. Let's see souls, God, come to the Lord. That's what it's all about. That's who we are. And I pray that you will fan into flame the gifts and the calling within us, that you will use us for your glory, for your honor. Lord, let Adventure Church make an impact in these communities, God. Let us not sit on our blessed assurance that Jesus is all mine. Let's give out Jesus to others who are in need. Let us not look at ourselves and become self-centered, but let us become field-centered. Let us become eye-centered onto the field. I have a dream. I have a vision. I have a plan for the field. And I pray, God, that you will raise up warriors, raise up warriors here today, that we, God, will be that church that extends a hand or a cup of cold water. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Come on, give the Lord praise. Amen. Now, as you're standing, I'm going to have my prayer warriors to come out my prayer. If you need prayer today, will my prayer sponsors come on out? Joe and, and the others, just come on, people that come out in prayer. If you need prayer today and you need prayer and you came here to say, Pastor, I need prayer today. And you say, I need prayer. I want you to step out. I want you to step out. Every Sunday, we're going to have these altars that are here available to pray for you. And if you need prayer, I want you just to step out this morning. They're coming now. Just come on. Just step out and stand by some of these people today. Come on, Michael. Come on. Come on. There's a couple right here. Come on. If you need prayer today, just step out. Let them pray with you today. Come on. Let them pray with you today. Anyone else today? Come on. If you need prayer, just step out. Let them pray with you today. Or we count to three. They're still coming. Come on. Let's welcome as they come. Come on. Anyone else? You need prayer today? Just come on. Let God just begin to touch you. Let them bless you. Let them minister to you today. Patty and Art right here. Come on here, honey. Patty, right over here. Right here. Come on. Come on. Here, Gwen, Rod, right here. Pray with us. Anyone else to say, Pastor, I need prayer. I need prayer. This is what it's all about. Life is changed at the altars. If you need prayer today, Anyone else? Anyone else? Father, go with us today. I thank you, Father, for this is a new beginning. We are walking in a miracle. Lord, I pray that you would bless each and every individual here today. And Lord, we thank you for today, and we thank you for what's in store. And we give you all the praise, all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you today. Have a great day in Jesus. Check out the place. If you're a new visitor, fill out a visitor card. Get your gift today. If you need prayer, still come up and get prayer. God bless you.